You are one, one lucky lady. Tell us why you're lucky. <laughs> you won this, um, well, for probably for many reasons, but, but, but you won this amazing trip to, on, on Tour Radar. Tell us a little bit about that whole experience. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting because I don't usually enter contests because I have a very scientific father and he's always explaining ratios and, and the likelihood of winning things, right? Um, and so, you know, my mom saw that there was this contest um, on TV and she told me that I should apply and um, I was kind of at a transition point in my life and so I applied and who'd have thought, but I won, um, myself and another stranger got to travel to five different continents, not just countries, but continents around the world going on five different intrepid tours um, in 50 days. So it was like a continual tour around the world and it was the most amazing experience I've ever had. Now you, you weren't a travel newbie either. So give us a yeah. little, cause I saw your like a, it was about a 60 second video or so that you did for them to kind of like, get them to pick you. And it was a great yeah. video. Tell us a little Thank bit you. about your travel experience right beforehand. Um, so I grew up in a family that um, my mom didn't really get to travel until she was until later in life. And she really appreciated how traveling can really broaden your horizons and take you out of your comfort zone. So I've spent a lot of time traveling the world with my family. But but the experience that I had with my family traveling and the experiences that I've had traveling compared to what Tour of the World offered were stark contrasts. Like the, the everything that I did prior was very, um, not scripted, but it was, you know, it was just kind of like a normal travel experience where you go on specific, you know, tours or you go and see certain landmarks. What we did with Tour Radar and Intrepid was like really adventuring for the first time in my life. I really went on an adventure. So it was it was pretty amazing, especially because I didn't know what we were doing from one day to the next. I got I didn't get like a full itinerary. I knew which places we were generically going to for vaccination purposes and a packing list. But I had no idea what we were going to be getting into. And that's fascinating because a lot of people might think the opposite. They might think, wow, if you're going to actually take a tour, a, you know, a normal tour, you think that's conventional. And yet for you, yeah. it actually stretched your travel limits, if you will. It, it, uh, is that because your family was taking even, you know, pretty, you know, normal vacations? They said, okay, let's go to Yosemite. Let's go to see the Grand Canyon or whatever. Well, you know, what's interesting is I grew up with a older sibling who has Down syndrome. And so we weren't really, we weren't really the family that goes and camps or goes and hikes. We didn't do that many outdoor adventure type stuff because my brother has limitations physically. Um, so, so it was more conventional um, just because of specific reasons like that. Um, not because we didn't want to, but that was just my experience growing up. Um, so I got to see a lot of things, um, but a, in a very, very, very different way um, than I did with, with Tour Radar and Tour the World. Right. And tell us a little bit about the experience of being behind the camera. So for those who haven't seen the series yet, is it's a fantastic series, and it really pisses me off that this well-produced series gets far less views than some stupid cat video on YouTube. It drives me crazy because you guys put a lot, well, you in doing some of the stuff, but the people, the post-production was phenomenal. The aerial shots, everything, just a ton of work. And, yeah. y and, and yet, you know, some guy does a cat video and gets more views. So I wish more people would actually have seen the thing. And it's of course available online on at tourradar.com. But go ahead and, and and uh, tell us about the experience about being behind a camera and, and having that whole thing being uh, shot and videoed. Yeah, it's unlike anything I've ever done before. I had never really been on camera like I was with Tour the World. Um, it's almost as if you, you, it gets to a point where you don't even realize that the cameras are there because our crew is so professional and um, they were just so meticulous with how they saw shots and how um you know how they planned things i mean the the agility of of these 
camera crew and how they are literally scaling mountains with with so much Year. you know <laughs> equipment on yeah. their back it's just so I'm I'm trying to get up this mountain and having a hard time breathing just with myself I can't imagine having to run up ahead of everybody so you can set up for a shot and then take everything down once we're past and then move on to the next it's just it, 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 it's very respectable like everything that they do um, and just so professionally do you have a new respect for reality shows or do you look at reality shows on television kind of like with a new lens Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, especially because there were so many moments that my friends would watch in the series and they'd be like, oh my gosh, did you guys, did you guys set that up? And I said, no, there's no, like, there's no way we could have set something like that up. It's just, it's just crazy to me how, how natural everything was and, and, and how, how professionally they documented and captured every single moment. Um, it does really make me appreciate the production of, of works like this and, and just, just the experiences themselves. That's yeah. interesting because a lot of people will make the claim that reality shows are not reality because it's all doctored up and it's all just uh, conflicts are manufactured and that kind of stuff. Um, now, maybe it could be the ethics of the f film crew. Maybe this film crew that you had was truly let's say let's be a fly on the wall and other uh reality tv shows are like let's kind of spice this up by making all sorts of apparent conflict when there is none yeah i mean the thing is is with travel there are so many hiccups and 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 travel is wonderful but it is really stressful because you don't know from one moment to the next, if things are going to turn out the way that you had planned. One of so, my one of my favorite uh, hiccups was the fact when Juan Juan was the other guy who won the thing. You're laughing right now. Which what which one are you thinking about? Because I wonder if we're thinking about the same one. When he lost his passport. Yes. <laughs> I mean, this guy. I can't even. I can't even put into words. He's he's this person, and we're polar opposites. Just uh -huh. to put that out there. Yeah. Um, but but we came back from the Amazon the day before we were leaving Peru. And so we flew in and went to the hotel and then woke up early to go to the airport. And, and you were flying to Italy or something? To the U.S. To the U.S., okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so we get to the airport and we're in the check-in line and Juan is just ripping through his bags. He can't find his passport. And... Me, okay, so so another thing about me is I was a flight attendant for a year. And so there are like certain things that you don't leave your house without, right? You you have like a checklist, a mental checklist. You're like, watch, whistle, passport, fan, you know what I mean? Like you have a checklist a and whistle? <laughs> you need a whistle. You need a whistle. Um, All right. I'll, I, that's not part of my checklist, so but go ahead. I'm just not. <laughs> um Have you yeah, ever well, used a whistle? Hmm? Have you ever used the whistle? No, thank goodness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank goodness. Right, um, okay. But so it was just really comical to me because I go through this mental checklist before I even leave my room. And the fact that we had gotten to the hotel, I mean, to the airport, and he hadn't he hadn't checked for this and it's actually a really good thing because it turned up in lost and found at the airport, which is mind boggling to me because if I had left my passport on a flight, the day before, the likelihood and, and the, the lost and found opened within minutes of us having to check into our flight. I mean, everything just in the universe aligned for Juwan. And I was just like mind blown, literally, that this guy has luck like no one else. It's, <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah, that was crazy. Um, yeah. I once lost my passport in Senegal, in Dakar, in the capital. I was, and I lost it right in front of the United States Embassy. Somehow, somebody picked it up on the floor. I don't know how it fell on the floor, but it must have fallen out of my pocket. Somebody found it, and then the U.S. Embassy called me the next day or two days later or sent me an email saying, hey, we've got your passport. So I totally lucked out because a U.S. passport in Senegal or anywhere in Africa, that's valuable stuff. I mean, you can use that potentially to uh, forge it, you know, da-da-da-da-da. So um, I also got lucky like Juan. So tell me a little bit more <laughs> about how you guys were opposites. Um, I don't know if I wonder if Tour Radar was planning that when they decided to pick you guys or it just happened to be 
that you guys worked out to be opposites? Give me examples of how you guys are opposites. Um, yeah, and I don't know. I don't know either. Um, because but to me, when I watch the series, you know, I think there's what mm-hmm. seven, eight episodes or so. Um, they're going to be eight total. Yeah, and yeah. so by the time this comes out, eight number eight will come out, and we'll get mm-hmm. into where that is. But mm-hmm. um, uh, when I was uh, watching it, I didn't get a. I did get. I would say this. This is my perspective. It didn't seem like there was a ton of chemistry. And what I mean by chemistry, not necessarily sexual chemistry or romantic chemistry. There was definitely not that. But but I even kind of like buddy buddy chemistry. I didn't see it as much on camera, and so I wasn't sure if there was, or if it just and and they just didn't capture it very well, or if you guys really are polar opposites and somehow just never clicked. Um, yeah, I would definitely not, not, say not like enemies, but but also just, you know, like sometimes you're not like it's not like you hate somebody. It's just like you just oh. somehow just don't find you just don't met, meet as on a friendship yeah. level somehow, you know, it just doesn't that chemistry, the friendship chemistry doesn't like take off. Yeah. And um, that is very true. Um Juwan and I are just very different people. We, you know, I was raised in a way where I had to be very responsible from a really young age. Um, You know, having a sibling with a disability, I'm very hyper aware of my surroundings. I'm very, um, you know, considerate of, of the space that I occupy and the people that I share that space with. And, um, and I'm not saying that Juwan wasn't totally um, that he just he just is a he's a lot younger than me. We're almost ten years apart, mm. um, and you know we've had very different life experiences. He hasn't traveled as extensively as I have, um, and I don't think he had to have as much responsibility as I did growing up. And so so our relationship was almost like siblings. Mm. where I was like an older sibling to him. And so I would, which is, and I felt bad. I would apologize sometimes because I'd be like, I'm sorry, Sean. Like, I don't mean to do this. It's just like inherently who I am. So if you like leave something on a seat and I say, Juan, or like, you know, I remember when we were taking the train to um, Machu Picchu and he left his ukulele, he was probably going to come back for it because he doesn't leave his ukulele anywhere. Like if you remember something, it's his ukulele. It's like, it's like an extra limb, but he, uh, he had left it on the train and I grabbed it. And, um, you know, and I feel like me, like, I, I just have a tendency to look after people. It's like an inherent quality of mine um, from from the way I grew up. And I think he would get annoyed with me because of that. And so it was it was really just like any kind of experience you have with with people that you don't know, um, getting to understand how people operate, uh, what makes them tick. Um, as you, especially as you spend a lot of time with them when you travel, um, you know it's really a process, and you you learn to really appreciate um, people and their differences, and how how you can really learn a lot from people who aren't like you. Even though you wouldn't necessarily choose to go do something with them, we learn so much from each other, and I think that we really appreciated each other at the end. And when you do speaking about choosing people and, and who you travel with, when mm-hmm. you go with tour radar there's only a limited or no choice of who you go with unless you purposefully book the tour with your buddies, known people, because otherwise mm-hmm. there's no way to say like, hey, I only want to go with women or I only want to go with men or mm-hmm. I only want to go with uh, people from China or, you know, in other mm-hmm. words, you have no control over who goes on that tour, correct? Um, yes, uh, but, but I think that's what's so beautiful about the experience is that you know I feel like there's so many misconceptions about group tours and um, you know and and it can be really frustrating especially if you're like a solo traveler and you go to cities where there are these giant herds of people following a colored umbrella or a flag and they occupy a lot of space and it kind of takes away from the beauty of a place and and the experience you have of you know really immersing yourself in a culture um so i feel like there are a lot of misconceptions but like you know small group touring especially with um, a lot of the partners um, that Tour Raider has, uh, like Intrepid, it's a very um, 
you know, intimate experience. And, and I don't think that if you decide that you want to sign up, there are so many options on, on their site, by the way. I mean, there are 40,000 different tours and there are different specifications that you can look at when booking a tour, whether it's the length or what type of travel or what type of accommodations, just in those sort of choices, you eliminate people that you might not want to be a, so, you know, to be going through these travel experiences with. But for me personally, I'm just, you know, I'm very curious about people and what bring them to a place and, and understanding, you know, we're here for a similar experience, but we can be so different. So even if I did turn up to do this, like, hike on a mountain and there were people that were 20 or 30 years older than me i would i would be blown away at the fact that you know this is really cool that you guys are signing up for this and i want to know more about you and like what has led you to this place like what has brought you here at this point in your life because i just think that there's so much that we have to learn from each other and at the end of the day we're way more similar than we are different right. so very well i said. think yeah, so I just think that, you know, no, you can't really pick, but I think that when you go through the process of choosing a, a you know, a tour, that that eliminates a lot of the, the people that you would, might not be excited to be traveling with in the first place. And I will also add that one of the travel 101s, you know, the most basic things about travel is to have an open mind. Yes. And that r not just open mind to other cultures that you're going to be going to, open mind to the other foods, to other places, uh, habits, uh, rules, regulations, mm -hmm. but also your travel partners and the people around traveling around you. Whether you're on a tour or not, there's probably going to be other travelers around you in most places unless you're going to Burkina Faso. So, you know, in general, you're, you're going to have people around you and you have to be open that not everybody's going to have your values, your way of thinking, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the biggest lessons that I really walked away with is is when you go into an experience with an expectation. Now, mind you, I didn't know what I was getting into. So having expectations wasn't something that was going to benefit me because when people have expectations, very specific expectations about a place or a culture or a food or anything about an experience that they're going to have, they're really just setting themselves up for a disappointment because nobody else has that expectation but them. So, so you know, I mean, it's, it's not only about leading with an open mind, but an open heart and like really being willing to, um, you know, get familiar with and, and be empathetic with other people and to learn about other cultures and experiences. And, you know, that's what traveling is all about. True. Now, Juan, I, I love how you described your relationship with him as a, as a sibling. I mean, because now that you said it that way, I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I saw on the screen. You know, I, was kind of, I couldn't really like pinpoint the words to describe what I was watching. I was like, they're like, definitely not romantic. Zero <laughs> that. I could see that. But it's like, but they don't hate each other. But they're not like buddy buddies and like siblings. That's it. <laughs> that's what they are. <laughs> People like you hang out with but, and you have some good moments, but sometimes you're like, Wah, I need some space mm -hmm. away or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. What was some other hidden moments off camera? Because one of the things that, you know, I've done a lot of filming out when I've traveled uh, trying to capture my thing. And, and one thing is for sure is that there's way more experiences off camera than on camera just because they're trying to squeeze a how many days were you in Italy, for example? Um, I, I think it was less than 10. Right. So 10 days in Italy. And the episode was, what, 45 minutes long? Um, I think, I don't think any of the episodes are really more than 20 minutes. Okay, 20 minutes. Okay, um, fine, fine. Even more. Okay, so you've yeah. got, um, so 10 days. So that's 240 hours. Okay, so, but you're sleeping some of those hours. But anyway. You're, you're, and then you got to squeeze that all in far less than an hour. So obviously there's a lot more shit going off of screen than, than on screen. So give us some of the nuggets of things that, that we missed that were funny moments, um, production challenges, et cetera, that, that, that come to mind. Okay. Um, I think you even have a list of all the things. That <laughs> I mean, I, I, I kind of do um, just because there's so much that happened and I don't want to forget anything. Um, but 
but let's start in Peru. Um, I think some of our best nights were when... Sorry, uh, Peru for the, for the audience members was your first destination. Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting is I didn't even meet Juan. I didn't know anything about Juan until I was on camera meeting him in the first episode. Us like giving each other a hug and having this little conversation was like literally the first times we had ever seen each other, heard of each other, knew each other's names, anything. So wow. so you didn't even know if it was going to be a, a man or a, girl, a woman? Nope. Wow. Yeah. Like going in with no expectations is yeah, really the sure. way to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, we, I think some of the best nights in Peru um, were when we were camping on the Inca Quarry Trail. So we hiked for three days and um, stayed um, in tents on the mountain during the hike for two nights. Um, and what was really cool about, about this experience is it really takes you away from a lot of distractions. And it really you know, you, you, you're around people. There's nowhere, there's, I mean, there's nowhere really to go. Um, so you're all with each other and you really get to know each other in a very, um, you know, different way than you would if you were in a city at a bar or, you know, what we would typically do. Um, and, and we would, I remember we would have our dinner and we would have our porters who would, would help us set up, they would set up our tents, they would cook us dinner. It was quite the experience. But we would sit around the table and um, after dinner and we would talk and exchange stories and we had icebreakers with our porters and a lot of um, the Peruvian porters, um, you know, were very proud of their families and there would be, you know, there would be cultural, um, you know, things, things would pop up that you wouldn't you know, think about. So when we did icebreakers, we would go around and talk about, you know, our family, if we had kids, blah, blah, blah. Well, well the Quechuan word for baby is Wawa. And one of the people in our group wasn't in there at the beginning of the icebreaker and he came in and when we would go around, they'd be like, I have four Wawas. He would think that they were talking about Chihuahuas and for the whole trip. And it was this running joke because we would laugh so hard. He's like, I just don't understand. Like, I don't even see very many Chihuahuas here. And it was just so funny because, because we would go around, he'd be like, I have no Wawas. And, and so it was funny. And then, and then that, you know, other things came up from that. Um, we, we realized that um, it's interesting because technology came about and it was supposed to really bring us, you know, together as people and make the world a smaller place. And it did in a lot of ways. And one of the guys, after he was talking about his kids, started singing. Ba he was telling us about Baby Shark. And we're like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. We were on a mountain. A shark? In Wawa? No, a baby. You don't a know a baby? <laughs> <laughs> Wawa shark. Yeah. Wawa shark. Yeah. So it was just funny because, because who would have thought that, that people in such a remote, different place on, you know, on the planet would know what baby shark is. And the next thing you know, Juan has his ukulele out and we're all doing baby shark and we're doing all the, it was just, it was just really comical because, because technology has a way of bringing us together in a way that we aren't really aware of. And that was a really cool moment to, we laughed about it for the rest of the trip and we would always break out in song. So that was really funny. Um, let me, <laughs> let me just do a quick plug for tour radar. Tour radar um, is giving away $1,000 of travel credits to people mm -hmm. who go to wanderlearn.com, my website, wanderlearn.com slash tour radar. And you can enter a chance to win a thousand dollars of travel credits. So, uh, that's pretty cool. So in your case, you didn't get to spend your travel credits. They they decided to spend your travel credits, Jessica. Um, tell us a little bit more about some of your um, off-camera funny things. So I was in Peru. You probably had th things mm -hmm. that happened to you in, in Italy or you went to the United States. Uh, by the way, you haven't even mentioned the, the five continents that you hit. Yeah. You went so to Africa. Yeah. Um, so first we went to South America. We went to Peru and we spent our whole time in Peru, but we didn't just stay in one place. We started by the coast in Lima, went up to Cusco, then did the Inca Quarry Trail, Machu Picchu, and then flew to the Amazon. Mm. Um, so we covered a lot of ground yeah. in Peru and saw so much. It was really cool. We were there for almost two weeks. Then we went to the U.S. and did a road trip from New York all the way down to New Orleans. And, um, you know, went through Tennessee, hit Memphis and Nashville. Super cool. I've never been to those places. Um, 
Then we flew over to Italy. So Europe was the next destination and Italy is what we did. We started in Rome and then we took a bullet train over to Naples and uh, chartered a sailboat and sailed the Amalfi Coast. And that was insane. Uh, the CEO of T Tour Radar, Travis, joined us and that was an amazing experience. And um, Hold on, let me stop you there because I interviewed Travis uh, before and so I just wanted to see what kind of things you learned from meeting Travis face to face because I've actually never met him face to face and he sounds like a fun great guy he's the CEO of Tour, of Tour Radar so I remember seeing you guys uh you sat down for dinner that was I think your first time you met him right yeah yeah, yeah. so then uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Travis I mean because of course Travis is not gonna have time to listen to this podcast so he's he, we can say all sorts of terrible things about him go ahead he, yeah <laughs> <laughs> Except that there isn't really anything bad to say about Travis. He is pretty wonderful. The fact that he, um, you know, really curated this experience and really wanted to to create this for people was really, really cool. Um, he is all about, with Tour Radar um, and his partners, he's all about creating really culturally rich experiences for people and for, for travelers around the world and I really have a lot of respect for him because he he really um, lives what he preaches and he he really tries to make every single experience full of life and fun and laughter and friendship and and he wants to make the best out of every single experience possible and he has a way of keeping it very lighthearted and he even <laughs> Travis, he created this challenge, this game where he bought this really funny looking hat and somebody would have to be challenged and the group would decide like what we were going to challenge the people to do. Um, and then the person who um, challenged the person would then be challenged to do something. My challenge was to convince a gelato shop owner to allow me to serve gelato to our whole group from his shop. But the catch was, was I was only allowed to speak Italian <laughs> and this, none of this was on camera and it, it ended up just being really funny. Uh, the guy put me in an apron and he stood back there with me and he put a hat on me. It was just, it was a lot of fun. It really broke down barriers and really allowed people to open up in a different way. And so I am just really grateful for, for the way that Travis, um, impacted the experience and reminding us that life's too short not to be having fun and really enjoying people so um and then he and he lives that through tour radar so now one of the things that was not apparent to people who might have been watching the thing and, and they're thinking that this is capturing a typical tour in some ways it wasn't typical at least for you and juan because yeah. you guys had to do so much b-roll in other words filming off camera not off camera, but um, filming post experience to talk mm -hmm. about sharing your experience on the camera. Whereas the other people who were on your tour had free time. So give us an idea of how much free time you have that the tour lets you go off and do things on your own. Well, and that's what's so cool about Tour Radar. As I said, 40,000, over 40,000 different types of tours. Um, mm. they, have, they have options for every kind of traveler. Um, every, uh, you know, they have different time frames. They have overland tours that go for months. They have tours that are just, you know, they have boat tours or, or sailing expeditions just in the Mediterranean. They have them for younger adventure seekers where it's mostly hiking and camping, or they have, you know, party kind of themed for younger adults. Um, they have all sorts of options for every traveler everywhere, which makes it amazing. And I think that there's a huge misconception about group tours that everything is just like, you know, you get, you wake up early, you have some, you know, mediocre breakfast, you get on a giant bus, you, you're bus to the next destination, you walk around, it's boring. What's really cool is you really get to, to, to craft your own kind of specifications. I mean, you can be like, yeah, I do want to go to Peru and I want to see Machu Picchu, but I don't want to hike and I don't want to camp. They have those options. Right. And if you don't want to take a bus, they have private transportation. So right. 
the the you know the options are endless and and actually what's... it's interesting because one of the ways that they actually show that in the video is that there's a point where you can actually pick for for those who haven't seen it on their website on tour radar mm -hmm. website you can actually say hey do you want to follow jessica who's going to be going uh, i don't know uh, to Sardinia or I can't remember where you went some you know climb some mountain or you want to go see some village or something like that and so yeah. you can actually pick and so I imagine Intrepid yeah. or Tour Radar gave you that option even f within your group itself so you even within a tour you have choices mm -hmm. yeah which is really cool so so you do get options but then they also give you a lot of information so if you do have off time they say okay so we're not gonna meet this afternoon, it's a free afternoon, but here are some cool things that you can do in the area. Right. And you know, you can either just lay low or you can go do these other adventure seeking things. So it's really cool that they give you all these, these different options. Now, um, what do you do if there's a personality mismatch? Cause you went on to what I think, was it eight different tours, am I right? Within this around the world tour? We did, so we did a different tour per, continent so it was five tours, five tours for each yeah so but but each each tour was very different I would I would say that although we were camping and hiking and and whatnot in Peru it was it was more like luxurious accommodations in the states it was um, we were staying in hostels and we were camping and we were you know in Peru they would set up our tents for us. In the States, we were setting up our tents. Right. And mind you, I had never been camping before. Really? Wow. I had never set up a tent. <laughs> I had never done any of the things associated with camping before this trip. But by the time we got to Africa, I Have you ever I broken am... a nail? Have I what? Have you ever broken a nail? <laughs> I don't really have nails. Oh, I'm, okay. I was an athlete growing up, okay. but um, so I'm not like a girly girl. Um, okay. But, but, but you just yeah, never no. done camping. And so yeah, and I, and I think that's also because of the way I was brought up with my brother yes, and the way that told, we traveled. Yeah, so, right. so I mean, you know, not that I wasn't, not that I didn't want to do that. It's just not something that I had done. Got it. And so, so then what was, yeah. uh, how was, was camping worse than you expected or better than you expected? It was a lot easier than I expected. Yeah. And it was really, um, there are so many things that I thought that I couldn't do that I realized through this experience and through our sponsors that, that like I, I, I not only can do, but I can do well, and I really like it. Right. So there's, there's nothing like sleeping in the Okavango Delta right. amongst hippos and, and elephants. Like that is cool. It and is cool. I, and I also, by the way, here's a quick tip for anybody who's watching, listening, um, is that if you have trouble sleeping outside, the easiest solution is to just have a very stimulating, intense day physically intense or whatever because then you're going to be so exhausted by the end of the day you're just going to bonk out and and you can sleep anywhere so that's one way to, to if you have trouble camping you haven't worked hard enough during that day or at least stimulated enough i think uh, i don't know if you had that same experience yourself when you did your camping oh yeah i mean we had such jam-packed days that I, I slept better. It did. I, I got to a point where I can sleep anywhere. Right. It doesn't matter where I am. If I'm tired, I will, I will be asleep. Um, and, what, and I think that's just because you're, you know, you're just exhausted. What did doing you, what did you learn about yourself? Cause that one thing I, I believe is that travel transforms you and the more you travel and the more exotic places you travel, the more you push yourself and go to new places, the more it's going to transform you. What did Jessica before the travel and how she, is she after this travel? What's changed? Um, gosh, so much, so much, but, but still trying to navigate, um, how to really understand all the changes because, you know, the, the world we live in is, is very intense and it's, and, and there are lots of distractions and there's constantly things happening all the time. Um, so you know, it's the reason I like travel is because you really are living in the moment. And, um, and so I would say that, that, you know, we, we tend to be put in a box and, um, are kind of told what we should do, what we shouldn't do, how we should live our lives, what we think is right. And, and traveling really broadens those horizons. And, and I didn't know that I would like camping or that I could, mm. that I was capable of, of 
climbing a mountain without training um, to over 14,000 feet above, you know, sea level. Like that was in Peru. these things, yeah, these things were difficult for me, but, but it really changed the way that I want to travel. I don't, I don't really um, enjoy mediocre, you know, not adventurous, pushing the limits, being uncomfortable. We really grow when we're uncomfortable, when we're comfortable and we're around people that we get along with and we don't have to question things and we don't have to, you know, you know, sit in a, in a seat where, where we're like, Hmm, I'm not, I'm, I, you know, you just are constantly expanding. Um, when, when you are questioned and you're questioning things and you're trying to understand, um, the way that life is and, and bigger than, than the reality that you live in at home. So, um, I just say that I, I believe in myself a lot more, that there's a lot more that I want to see. There's a lot more that I want to try, um, in terms of after tour of the world, I just, I just definitely broaden my horizons in terms of what I want to do. So if you won this contest for a thousand dollars of travel credits, how would you spend that thousand dollars? Again, go to wanderlearn.com slash tour radar to, to enter, to win that contest. But if you won it, what, or where would you go or what would you do? I would go to Vietnam. Vietnam. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, wait, hold on. Where did you go in? Uh, I'm blanking out on where you went in Asian, the Asian continent. God. We are last leg of the journey. After- oh, Thailand. Okay. We're giving it away. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean. But yes, um, but it's not giving it away because right now we're recording this right before it gets released. But ye- by the time this airs, you will have revealed the final episode, which is in Thailand. And yes, mm-hmm. so so you went to Thailand and now all of a sudden you, you, well, talk a little bit about, since that will, I haven't seen it yet, but go ahead and talk a little bit about that episode and and then later tell us about why you want to go to Vietnam. Um. So, so the episode will be airing on the 19th of September. It is the last, um, and it's the final episode of Tour of the World, um, bittersweet. Um, but I had never been to Asia, so I was really, really excited. Um, to go to Thailand. It's different than anywhere I've ever been. And there's so much beauty and, and, um, the people were just so wonderful and, and had huge hearts and, and were very, you know, embraced us with open arms. Um, I just had never really felt that, uh, in, in that way before. And, and the, the, the country and and the the landscapes are just so different than anything I've ever seen. Um, some and people, I really some people uh, criticize, and some people either I've heard mixed reviews about Bangkok, the capital. Some people say it's dirty, it's polluted, it's congested, it's really gross. You want to leave there as soon as possible. Other people say no, it's it's a lot of fun, great food, and you know nightlife and da 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 da. So, what was your take of of Bangkok? I don't know how many how much time you spent there. Um, we only had two nights there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say that that everything that you've heard is true. And it just depends. There are, you know, people would say that about New York City or Los Angeles. You know, people like cities. People don't like cities. I think that it really, Bangkok really does, um, you know, cater to the people who like cities. But it's really cool because there's hustle and bustle and there's there's so much to see and it's very vibrant and the colors and the foods and the markets we went to a floating market and then and then there's a market that's like on the side of train tracks and there's a train that actually goes through and they have to they have to close everything up so the train can fit it's just it's just remarkable um the the different types of produce and everything that we got to try um you know it was just it was a very different experience and and I really really like Chiang Mai personally I think that it's it's nice because just like San Diego we have somewhat of a city but then there's exteriors so so we're you know close like a lot of cities in California where you have like mountains and beaches and so you can really escape and go do things in nature but also have the convenience of of you know wi-fi. being close <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah wi-fi so um or shows or you know whatever it is that that tickles your fancy so so yeah no i i, I just love thailand I wonder if the Thai food, you know, one thing I, I've lived with Chinese people and they've told me that the food in China doesn't, sorry, the Chinese food in America is never like the stuff in China. 
And I haven't been to China yet. So I imagine if the Thai people probably say the same thing, like, no. So did you notice a big <laughs> difference between the Thai food in Thailand versus the Thai food in America? I mean, obviously it depends on the restaurant, but. Or... I mean, yes and no. What was really, really cool about our, our Thailand trip is it was actually like a foodie cultural trip. So that we took. Good. We took cooking lessons oh, wow. um, from locals and went to the market with them and learned how to pick out produce and made our own curry paste with pestle and mortars. And it was just, I have, a, I don't think that, you know, we had, we had a woman, Noi, who was amazing. And she, she, um, gosh, she's just an amazing woman. And, and she just says, you can't, you can't not you can't say no to things and you can't decide if you like something if you're not willing to try it you have to try things you have to be open-minded about things before you decide that you don't like it um and and she you know gave us uh at least one five hour long cooking class and it was just really it made me appreciate food especially curry so much more and and you can really taste every single ingredient when you know how to make it. You know, it's just it just makes you appreciate it so much more. And and I I mean it's very different because we actually made it there um, with locals. So so I think that yes, it it's you can't really get that because there's so much love and time and energy that goes into the meal that you make there as opposed to getting it at a restaurant here. Why Vietnam? Um, I just think that it's different than anywhere I've been thus far. And if there's one thing I learned about traveling, it's that I want to take myself out of my comfort zone and really immerse myself in experience. So I want to go and learn how to ride a motorcycle and, and just really check out the country. <laughs> okay. So that will be on the list. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, wh how was the ending when you had to say goodbye to everybody and say goodbye to Juan, your brother, <laughs> your little bro, <laughs> your little bro. And, 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 and probably there's, was, was the film crew always changing or did this say, were there some people who were always with you? There were five of us. We called, um, we called ourselves the big five. Um, including you and Juan. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. there's three camera related pe film production people. Yeah, so there was the creative producer, um, and he had two film guys, and then it was me and Juan, and so it was me and four men right, the right. whole trip. Right. So <laughs> that was the constant. Um, so I was definitely like a mother hen the whole time, <laughs> whether they couple, were excited. A couple of last questions before we wrap up. One was, what was your, of the five continents in the five tours, which one was stood out as number one you've probably been asked this or thought about this before so yeah that's like the number one question i've gotten yeah, and sure. th the thing is i was is, almost gonna not ask it but i was like you know fuck it there's some people who want to know <laughs> <laughs> you can't really compare them and i think that that um you know i had been to two of the destinations before and it's Which the ones? three that i i had been to italy and mm. i you know obviously the states mm. um but um but you had not been I, to tennessee no, I hadn't, but we started in New York and DC and a lot of, you know, so I mean, it's just the familiarity of the culture, sure, sure. I think as well. Um, yeah, there's a different culture in New Orleans than there is in California, but we all speak the same language. It's, it's just, yeah. you know. Sure, sure. Um, so I think that there were different things from the different tours that I went on in uh, per Peru, Africa, and uh, Thailand. So we went to South Africa, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. Yeah. Most of our time was spent in Botswana. Um, but those three places really, um, they really challenged me mm -hmm. in a way that I felt so much more comfortable and confident with myself as a person, mm -hmm. um, which you would think that it would be the opposite. But I... I learned so much more about myself um, in the places where I was unfamiliar. So, so where are you going to go next? Uh, what's your, I mean, maybe Vietnam, I, I, I realize that, but uh, what's your, what's your travel? I mean, what's your life plans really now that you've gotten this, uh, how, how long did it take, by the way, this whole thing from start to finish? Uh, 52 days. 52. Wow. That went go by so fast. 52 it days. Did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It did. So, um, yeah. so what are you now? You're back in San Diego or are you going to you retire <laughs> I wish um yeah retire and travel money grow on <laughs> trees um 
you know, I'm really actually taking a step back and um, evaluating what I want to do with my life because I had just finished grad school a year before I in what one uh, social innovation, which is an emerging field, okay. um, but I think it's very necessary. But there isn't exactly a job market for it, so so it's it's really um, you know challenging trying to to understand what I want to do with my life because I really. Um, you know, want to contribute to to this place that I live, but also, you know, really live my life in a way that I want to as well. So I definitely don't think, especially after the experience, that uh, a nine to five is something that's possible. Um, but you know, we'll see. We'll see where where this opportunity um, takes me, and and I'm definitely open to new and exciting. Um, experiences and opportunities yeah widespread travel is really detrimental to a career it just kills it that's what happened to me it just completely destroys your desire to like live in a cubicle i mean uh, not that anybody really has that strong desire but whatever like put up with it you'll do with it then all of a sudden after you've traveled and traveled you're like no effing way am I going to do this (laughs) for the rest of my life you know or at least for 20 years or anything god yeah, it seems so monotonous it's and, and really like you're going through the steps of, of, you know, being miserable with a lot of other people. I think that there's so much more um, to appreciate in life and, and, and just because you have a blue collar job or a white collar job doesn't define you. And I think that, you know, what people do with, with their experiences in their life goes so much beyond, goes beyond what you do for a living. So, you know, I just, I just think that it's definitely made me stay, step back and think about my next steps. Very good. Well, Jessica, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And to remind listeners uh, to go to wanderlearn.com slash tour radar to have a chance to win $1,000 of travel credits on tour radar. And uh, what's the best way for people to follow you and follow your next step in life, Jessica? Do you have like uh, either Facebook, Instagram, or some other way to, to, to stalk you? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I do have an Instagram and I have been posting a lot of behind the scenes and some of my own uh, pictures from the trip. Um, you can just type in Jessica Husson or uh, Jess underscore K-U-H uh, is my username, okay. Jessica. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I've been posting on. Wonderful. Well, thank you again yeah. so much. Thank you Happy so much. Travels. And you.